Thank you, Sarah. Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the finance audit and costing session. Uh, my name is Christy Keen. I'm Senior Director of Research Finance at the University of Chicago and Co-Chair of the Finance Audit and Costing Committee. I am pleased to be joined today by my Co-Chair Michelle Bowles, Director of the National Institutes of Health Office of Policy for Extramural Research. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, today, we will hear from Michelle for her always helpful updates and from Tim Reuter from Stanford to share some more information on the Treasury Offset Program. So if you have questions today, please feel free to use the chat function or the raise hand feature. Um, next slide. Uh, and so now I'll hand it off to Michelle to get us started today. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, everyone. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the final um, federal financial reports, um, as well as the payment management system expired uh, payment requests. Um, my co-chair, Christy, is always making sure that um, I have the latest and greatest when it comes down to what our recipients need to know and understand, where there may be some confusion. So I'm going to kick us off with this information. I'll probably deviate. You guys know I don't st stick to the script, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> um, I just want to make sure that you all have the information you need. Um, and if you have questions, of course, I know you will, you, you'll ask. Next slide. And so we had to uh, change directions when we switched from the payment um, from ERA commons submitting FFRs to PMS. Um, and so NIH is now in the process of reinstating final FFRs, meaning we will not call final FFRs annual FFRs anymore. We had to do that just because a lot of our constraints were made around the fact that when NIH um, transitioned from ERA to PMS um, with the elimination of the cash transaction report before the elimination of the cash transaction report, we were hitting against a lot of, um, of um, FFRs that would just not reconcile. Um, and so for us, what we wanted to make sure of is that our recipients could get their FFRs in you um, so that you didn't have audit findings and so that our transition reinventing grants management didn't have a, um, you know, a backlash. So in March of 2021, <clears throat> soon after we transitioned from ERA to PMS, we made a decision almost immediately to make all FFRs annual due to the constraints of the FCTR and um, it, it, it impacted NIH and RSA training grant awards. And what does that mean? It meant that with the elimination of the FCTR in April 22, we were able to develop alternative methods to make sure that our recipients were able to report on expenditures on our training grants and made the decision to re-implement the final FFRs. We were not able to receive FFRs from our recipients on our training grants and frankly, a lot of different grants to be quite honest with you. Um, and so when we had to make that change, we wanted to make the change to benefit our recipients until we could see what was the change, what was the um, transition doing to the system. And clearly the system was rejecting a lot of FFRs, not allowing our folks to submit FFRs. Um, and, and so we wanted to make it right. As a result, NIH took the position that we would have to put ourselves in harm's way of an audit <laughs> and actually change over our annuals to finals. So now with the, with the force of the reconciliation, what happens here is that the cash receipts under 10A and the cash disbursements under 10B and the expenditures under 10, 10E um, will be, need to be reconciled before an FFR can be submitted. Um, and that's probably not something that folks want to hear, 
but we will not be able to receive or nor we can receive it, but we won't be able to accept an FFR unless all of those buckets equal. And that should have been the case and you know all along, but I don't feel like we prepared our recipients for that um, transition. And with that being said, I think we had to turn those into uh, those finals into annuals to accept them and begin to transition over after the FCTR was eliminated. Um, the elimination um, of the FCTR um, has helped us in that now the differences between the PMS authorization and the disbursement amounts um, will be accepted and it literally will not cause us to have to reject many FFRs. The final FFRs will be reinstated um, in October, uh, which will be the beginning of the fiscal year, literally 15 days. <laughs> so you guys have that to look forward to. Next slide. <clears throat> and so for the PMS expired request, uh, payment request, recipients should make every attempt, honestly, to process your final draw from PMS within 120 days of the performance period date. We recognize that uh, PMS has highlighted the fact that there's 90 days. NIH fought very hard to make sure that those requests um, were uh, allowed for up until 120 days of the performance period. And we worked with uh, PMS yesterday, as of yesterday, um, to make sure that that 120 days was reinstated. Requesting funds from PMS um, 120 days after the performance period as we all know is not appropriate and should be avoided as a payment request, may not be approved by the awarding institute and center. Now, I wanna to talk to you guys about that because we had a, you know, a really good way forward where we were able to get um, NIH, HHS, and PMS on the same page to do the 120 days um, because the 90 days was not enough for our sub-recipients. Um, and then, at some point, um, we recognized that even 120 days um, was being pushed and, and tested. When we pushed for the 120 days, we recognized that there may have been some recipients um, due to you know, a strong justification for why it couldn't be um, completed in 120 days, um, like sub-recipients with foreign subs, you know, really outside of the box um, scenarios, we recognize that that was gonna be a, a problem. The challenge is the request to extend or the request for a justification to not be able to submit your um, final reports, um, <clears throat> processing your draws within 120 days has become the norm. Uh, we're receiving hundreds of justifications um, and we don't know if it is related to COVID or if it's related to the fact that um, PMS put it back down to 90 days, but we really want you all to understand that the 120 days is um, the final draw. And unless there's a true justification, we should not, should not be moving away from that. Um, one of the things that we've Im implemented as well is that we will be uh, requiring institutes and centers to um, continue to provide a justification to OPERA for why we need to move beyond that 120 days. Um, and we will be also working with FDP and others to make sure that we understand what those 120, uh, beyond 120 days strong justification means. And the reason why I think it's important for us is because we recognize that, you know, the 120 days is in place. Uh, and we know that there may be some justifications, but the justifications cannot become the norm. If there's a need to go beyond that, PMS is gonna flag the draw as an expired pay, um, payment request. And that's not a good look for an audit. So we wanna make sure that we protect you guys by understanding what that um, extension is, why, and then of course, documenting it. Um, the 
following process needs to be followed when we are looking at the expired payment request. Next slide. Prior to attempting to draw the funds from PMS, the recipient must contact the awarding institute, okay, and to request the approval and provide a strong justification. And I highlighted and the staff highlighted strong in red um, because what I said to them was, I want to make sure that whatever strong means, we can collaborate with our partners at FVP and the recipient institutions to understand what that looks like. And then once we see the various scenarios, we can come back and work with them on what we believe truly is strong and what um, we can do to accommodate the, the um, justifications that are strong. Uh, for those that we determine may not be strong, uh, we will be, I want to be transparent with our partners to say, we don't really believe this is strong. And so you're likely not going to get a an extension. And I think that that's the way to go so that you guys know upfront what that looks like. Um, and we will be requiring source documentation because PMS is very concerned that NIH is partnering with our institutions, but not necessarily understanding the backdrop behind the justifications. And so we all want to put each other in a good place. The request must be provided to um, uh, provide the PMS subaccount, which is the award doc number, NIH grant number, the amount of funds that's requested, of course, a justification, strong justification <laughs> for the late payment. The recipient must also describe and um, what action is being taken by um, the recipient to prevent similar situations in the future. So you tell us why you need the justification and the corrective action that you're going to use in order to prevent it from happening in, in the future. Now, there may be scenarios where it might not happen. I, I just need to tell you guys, for those of you that are um, over 50, like I've moved through my hot flash. <laughs> so thank you, because I'm like fanning. But anyway, um, too much information. Um, but so the other thing is, is that we want to make sure that once you once you provide the justification, um, if there is a way that we can mitigate um, um, and correct that action for it not to occur again, we would like to uh, move in that direction. And I think um, a strong partnership within our um, uh, um, financial audit and costing committee um, would be a great way, Christy, for us to gather data and be able to work with our partner institutions to make sure that we understand what those justifications are, how we can prevent them. And if it can't be prevented, we need to document that for both the recipients as well as NIH. Um, and then of course the awarding institutions will, institutes will um, review the justifications and if appropriate, approve the one-time request. Um, and when we say one-time request, it truly needs to be a one-time request. If it is something that is systemic, and Christy and I talked about this yesterday, um, if it's systemic, we need to know about that up front because at that point, we need to provide a class deviation for certain types. Um, and then we need to work with HHS and OMB to help under, um, help educate everyone on why this is a, 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 a systemic issue. And it will always be in place no matter what. And then how we will work together as partners through FDP to correct those issues. Um, and then after receiving the approval from the awarding institute, the recipient can then submit the draw request to PMS. Next slide. So COVID. We all know COVID did a new thing in every aspect of grants administration. <laughs> It just did, <laughs> personally and professionally. And so for us, one of the things we wanted to make sure of is that you understand why the COVID funds are processed a bit differently. It differs for the awards with COVID funds due to HHS policies and the requirements that govern those that restrict the availability of those funds after the period of performance. Um, actually, even during the period of performance when things change. 
So every attempt should be made to avoid an expired payment request for COVID funded funding due to the, the restrictions. Um, after the FFR is accepted for an award with COVID, the unspent funds are returned to HHS and require NIH to um, request special permission to reauthorize them. So that is the restriction. And once those funds come back to NIH, they don't come back to NIH directly. Well, they come back, they hit the account, and then they are off limits. And so if our recipients are, you know, not spending and, and, and doing the expired payment request on COVID funds, the funds are not there. They're not ours. They are special appropriations. We have special um, provisions that govern them. And we have to make sure that the recipients understand that this puts the institutes and centers in a very precarious position when the funds are not expended on time. The institutes and centers are very um, passionate about the research. And we wanna make sure that this research gets done. I will tell you, I've witnessed our grants management officials scrambling, trying to make sure that our um, the funds on an expired payment request is allowed to be to be put forward um, to uh, the recipient, only to be told that the funds are not there. Um, and so we have to make sure that that is very very clear. So the special request is not guaranteed to be approved. You know, one might say that it is, but we have so many other initiatives across the HHS spectrum that if the funds are not expended and the funds are not, you know, um, authorized, didn't, um, are not approved by HHS, we have other areas within and under the umbrella of HHS where those fundings can be used and go to a, a good cause. So not to say this is not a good cause, but we wanna make sure that you all understand that those expired payment requests for COVID funding, it's not guaranteed. And you run the risk of losing the funds and we've seen it over and over and over again. Next slide, please. Michelle, uh, quick question. Can you clarify that the restriction is only applicable to COVID related funds or all funds issued during COVID? It's COVID related funds. Got it. Thank you. It's all about the supplemental appropriation that um, HHS and the POTUS the, and Congress um, allocated for COVID. Now, there are some institutes and centers that use their own IC appropriations to cover COVID activities. It doesn't apply to that, but it does apply to anything that we receive from HHS related to COVID. Thank you. Under the supplemental appropriations. So um, I just wanna remind folks that, that we talked a little bit last, probably earlier in the year, which I feel like it was yesterday, <laughs> but earlier in the year um, about OPERA taking on the FFR Reconciliation Center. Um, we talked about the fact that it was moving away from the Office of Financial Management um, and it was going to move into opera. Well, this was um, literally light speed, the speed of lightning, honestly. <laughs> like I've said things and we've had two years go by, three years go by, and then maybe it finally happened. Well, with this, it has been a true honor to be able to um, set up the um, opera Federal Financial Reporting Reconciliation Center um, that will be led by um, the one and only Alan Watley. And I know many of you know him. Um, Alan is our lead and he um, has the authority to hire several individuals, including contractors that will be able to help him reconcile those FFRs um, as well as he will be focusing on financial closeout, um, which is something that is new for NIH. We we're devoting a lot of attention to that 
because um, that's been something that we recognize from the administrative side of the house. We get all of our reports or not, um, and we you know, close out. But when we submit those 059s, which is the closeout transaction to the payment management system, things stop when the buckets don't equal. So Alan and his team are an amazing team that will be able to get this thing going provide very helpful information. And I know many of you have probably already talked to him. Um, so he is going to be responsible for making sure that the FFR are, FFRs are reviewed, analyzed, and reconciled, ensure for the um, timely financial closeout of all of the NIH awards within one year of the period of performance for the end date, but before, certainly. Um, and then working very closely with our administrative side of the house for uh, closeout, making sure that once the reports are received, um, then the financial piece kicks in. So it'll be a very collaborative engine that you will um, witness for that. We also um, plan to distribute reports to the NIH community that will assist in the timely financial closeout of NIH grants similar to those stale obligation reports for grants and expiring grant balances from years past. Um, and then of course, PMS um, expired payment requests, um, Alan will be looking at those um, and he will be looking at the justifications and we'll be providing you guys with a lot of feedback on what, that, um, what those justifications look like, um, but won't be doing that before we have an opportunity to um, come together as a community to figure out truly what is the strong justification and how that'll be used. Next slide. If you have questions, please contact the FFR Reconciliation Center within OPERA. Alan and his team will be looking at those um, hands-on. Um, I'm really excited to have him. I'm really excited to um, be able to uh, move some of the challenges that we've had um, forward. Um, we will be taking over those functions um, effective October 1 from the Office of Financial Management. Um, we have several um, FFRs that are in the backlog. We recognize it. I want to put it out there up front. <laughs> we recognize it. Um, but Alan uh, and his team will be working really hard to see how they can partner with OFM to take on those. Um, and if we need to take on all of them, it will be you know just a step-by-step -step process on how we can chop the big tree down. Um, but you guys have our support. You have my commitment um, and you have um, our commitment within the um, financial uh, audit costing um, committee to make sure that you know, if there are concerns or questions, um, challenges, uh, you know, I'm approachable. And of course, um, Christy is always available and always is willing to talk to me about various challenges that you all report to her. And I'm open to listen and open to try to help. So I will mute myself and um, thank, you. thank you for listening. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. I uh, really appreciate it. I think Alan just got an influx of emails, but uh, I know Alan is a problem solver. So um, I think very much uh, so. Yeah, that's that's good news. Um, I'm sure we'll have some questions and I do want to circle back um, to talk more about how we can partner uh, to talk about these strong justifications and, you know, perhaps uh, why justification is needed. Um, but before we do that, I want to make sure we have enough time uh, for Tim to give us an update on the Treasury Offset Program. So take it away, Tim. Thank you. Um, as the slide shows, I'm Tim Reuter, Senior Director of Post Award Operations at Stanford University. Next slide. Um, I, I, for many of you, this is uh, uh, these are some of the same slides I've used before, but for those that are new to this uh, session or haven't heard of this before, I have to uh, go back over some of these uh, slides again. So uh, I apologize for some of you hearing the same thing. I do hopefully have a few extra uh, things to add at the end. Uh, what is the Treasury Offset Program? Department of Treasury has the authority to offset payments made from one federal agency to satisfy debts of another federal agency. Basically, if uh, uh, you have a past due payment, 
uh, uh, an example for me, I have a, a Palo Alto VA center here, uh, just within a couple miles of campus and several of my departments will go to the VA and they will, uh, hire some of their researchers to come over and work for us, uh, on some of our awards. Um, if the department fails to pay that invoice, uh, to, um, uh, uh the VA, all of a sudden I am, uh, uh, I will get, you know, if, if it remains unpaid for 120 days, they will send that to the treasury and the treasury will offset the next payment they go to make to me. Uh, federal agencies are required by law to send any debt that's outstanding over 120 days. They're required to send that to the treasury and the treasury then offsets our payment. Uh, in fiscal year 2021, uh, the Treasury uh, recovered over $4.5 billion in federal and state delinquent debts. And that was because they um, uh, they suspended uh, the action for part of 2021 due to COVID. In, in 2020, uh, Top Offset recovered over $10 billion of federal money. Next slide, please. Quickly, uh, uh, if a payment is offset, uh, the treasury is the one that will send you a letter. The letter gives you the information of who the agency, you the payment was offset for. Uh, they'll tell you what agency you have the outstanding debt with. Um, it will very clearly state that they don't have any information on the debt other than what's in the letter. And you are instructed to call the agency. Uh, next slide, please. I had uh, several colleagues, uh, we called the treasury this summer and had a great conversation with them, uh, with this uh, uh, this unit, the uh, treasury offset unit, uh, and they were very uh, helpful on in the information they provided to us, but they were very, also very specific to say, treasury does not have a copy of the unpaid invoice. I just have to repeat that again, because they repeated that to us nor numerous times in our phone conversation with them. We have to contact the individual agency uh, uh, who's um, uh, listed on the letter. Uh, and this can take months to try to get a hold of some of this information or to get the agencies to be able to provide you with information. Next slide, please. Please uh, uh, note the um, um, uh, uh, web ad ad address up here, fiscal.treasury.gov slash top slash top. That is a great place for a lot of information that you can go to to try to uh, uh, get an understanding of how it works. Um, what can that, the, uh, the, the Treasury provide to you? Um, found out a little bit over a year ago that you can request uh, by sending a request to g2g at fiscal.treasury.gov, you can send them a request that they notify you with by sending you an Excel report on any day that they offset a payment to your institution. It, it's a huge um, report. It has 23 columns to it. Um, but once you are notified of the off offset, then you can go ahead and request even an individual copy of the individual letter, which the treasury does have. They don't have the copy of the invoice, but they have a copy of the individual letter. Um, so when you submit that uh, request to this address, they the uh, G2G program manager will send you a release of information verification form. And you have to provide at least two points of contact at your institution. But it basically says, and I had to sign it, I'm a fiscal officer of, the, of Stanford. So I had to sign it authorizing the treasury to release this information to these individuals at my institution uh, um, collectors basically that I have in my sponsor receivables management group for them to be able to request copies of the letter. So uh, the other thing that we were able to identify and that the, the treasury was willing to do for us, they sent me a listing. They went back over five years to uh, send me a listing back of five years of offsets uh, that, that Stanford has had uh, um, uh, you know, through the Treasury Offset Program. And it, one is a little daunting, uh, but two, it was nice to be able to see a lot of those things. Uh, next slide. Uh, once you're registered, what else can they do for you? Once you're registered, they, can, they will send you several data dictionaries explaining what the different fields on the Excel reports are. Um, also for Medicare and Medicaid, 
um, offsets. They will send you some information specific to those types of, of, of offsets and, and maybe where you can go to get some additional information. Um, then any day that they offset your payment, they will sub send you an email with a copy of this Excel spreadsheet. Normally it's just one line on the spreadsheet and they will tell you what's been offset that day and give you the information. Now, um, if you need a copy of the letter, again, once you've registered, if you need a copy of the ledger letter, you can fax a request to top offset at this fax number here Provide them your institution's taxpayer identification number, the debt account ID that will be on this uh, Excel spreadsheet, the date and dollar amount of the offset, and TOPS will mail you uh, through U.S. mail. They will mail you an ori the original letter uh, 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 to one of the contacts for your institution. Now, let me state here real quickly, one of the points that they were very clear to make to us is that where they have found this to be a lot more prevalent is institutions such as uh, uh, Stanford that has a hospital and the hospital shares our taxpayer identification number. So if you have that situation, you're gonna have more than likely more and more uh, Medicare offsets, um, either overpayments or whatever it happens to be. And uh, I, I, I it, it, it always seems that um, the payment request that is offset is always for a sponsored award at my institution. I don't know if it's against some other other payments that they're making my institution. But again, that we're the ones that, that get the majority of payments. You know, we have, all, as many of you do, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of federal payments to us. And so that's what gets offset uh, is, is a sponsored award payment. Next slide, please. So, we were also told that if you do receive this uh, uh, copy of the letter, you should be able to request, specifically you request for proof of debt from the agency, such as I should go to the VA and request proof of debt. Uh, it, it, by making that request, uh, the agency is supposed to send you a copy of the actual invoice or invoices representing the outstanding debt. Um, this is especially difficult if it's Medicaid or Medicare. One, uh, the, the, the numbers that are given for you to call some of these uh, debt management service for uh, uh, Medicaid or Medicare payments, uh, you know, overdrawn payments or, or overspent or whatever, um, you call that number and we have a lot of trouble getting them to even answer the phone. Uh, they won't even answer the phone. And if they do, it's either a, a, a voicemail message or if you talk to someone there, they will ask you, okay, you want proof of debt? Can you please tell me who the patient was? And you say, well, I don't have the patient name because I, 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 don't, I'll, I, you know, I don't have anything on that. And they tell you, they tell you that, you, well, they can't release the, the copy of the information to you because you don't know who the patient is. So I'm still working back through that. Um, but uh, uh, as I, we find out by, uh, other ways to be able to get some of that information, I will pass that on to you. Uh, another um, difficulty with this is that it's not always one invoice that equals one offset. Uh, you might have a payment coming to you for $10,000. Uh, you have an unpaid debt of $5,000. So they offset half of that uh, and we'll just send you a payment for $5,000. But you could also have a debt of $20,000 and they offset just $10,000 against that one payment that you're receiving. But then there's still that offset out there for $10,000 applicable to this other invoice that can, depending upon how the agency, uh, again, my for my example, the, the VA, how they report that unrecovered debt. Um, and I've got a, a, a classic example I have right now. I just had an offset of forty thousand dollars in October, or um, excuse me, in, in August. Uh, I requested from the VA copies of, of the debt, and they sent me one uh, invoice that would was clearly in their system that had had been sent to top offset four days before the Treasury had offset my payment to me of forty thousand dollars. But the second invoice they sent me was. 10 months old um, and, and those two did not add up to the $40,000. So now there's this whole reconciliation process I have to go through with the VA to try to find out which invoices they are or how far they go back or it, it's, it's, it's a real uh, uh, puzzle that you try to put together. 
Also, uh, another thing to note here for me is, and again, I will use the VA uh, as an example for me, the VA has an on your, on your Excel spreadsheet, they will send you for each individual, individual offset, they will give you a debt account ID number. And that debt account ID number is applicable to an individual department at your institution. So as an example, again, I have uh, uh, three, three departments that have shown up on my list, CV Med, uh, Radiology and Oncology over the, over the years that have not paid a debt. Um, and each one of those has a single debt account ID. So when I went to the treasury and we had this conversation, I tried to say, hey, is there any way you can send me a, a, a you know, to me centrally, a copy of all those letters? and was told quite clearly they could not because there isn't one central address uh, for the VA for them to uh, uh, send me the letter because they're all based upon the debt account ID number, which is the various departments uh, I have in the School of Medicine and centrally School of Medicine and all kinds of other things. So again, this is where the complexity comes in to what you're dealing with. Also, the offset letters are sent to the same address the agency has on file for that account, meaning the original invoice they sent to that address, the three follow-up in, uh, uh, invoices at 30, 60, and 90 days they sent to the same address, the offset letter they sent to the same address. So the department that ignored those four previous uh, uh, emails or information on, on hey, you haven't paid your debt, uh, that's where they also send the letter that said, you know, so again, more than likely they're going to ignore that again. So then your, your, your whole process starts where you're trying to get a copy of the letter. And, uh, you know, again, some, in, some uh, agencies require us to use some sort of generic institutional address, and that makes it very difficult because it doesn't help me identify the department at Stanford uh, uh, that is responsible for the debt if it just says, uh, it, it just is sent to Stanford University Board of Trustees uh, you know, at our main uh, address, uh, 450 Sarah Avenue in, in, in Stanford, California. Next slide, please. Um, some agencies, um, uh, certainly Medicaid and Medicare, some of those uh, different agencies that do that, they will use a debt collection service. So you may get a, a letter from a debt collection service that says, you owe me money. And again, it's the same process. You go back through, you ask for proof of debt. Uh, uh, if, you, uh, you know, if you've ever dealt with a collection agency, they don't have a copy of the original invoice. So then you have to go back through the same process to find out who that agency was that sent them that, uh, 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 that, that request for, for collection. So again, it's it's very difficult and uh, it's, not a, it, it's not very helpful. Next slide, please. What are other potential impacts to your institution of this? Uh, four years ago, I had a situation where um, a federal agency would not issue a contract to me because it showed in the federal system that I had an outstanding debt. Stanford, not me personally, but Stanford had an outstanding debt to uh, uh, to an agency. Luckily, it was the VA. I was able to work with the VA. The VA acknowledged that that debt had been paid by sending it to top offset. I had to go to my contact at the VA and they sent me an email stating that that debt had been paid. I was able to forward that on to the uh, awarding agency who was going to award me that contract and they released the contract. Um, now, again, they, the federal government isn't allowed to issue a contract if there is outstanding debt. If they check and there's outstanding debt, they're not allowed to do that. So again, this is another reason that uh, it's good that they do the top offset because you don't, you, you realize you have an outstanding debt and it only stays outstanding for 120 days and then it's submitted to top uh, and, and they, they cover it and therefore hopefully they will release the outstanding debt. Uh, but again, it's something else that you have to be aware of and if any of you have dealt with conversations with faculty that are very upset that their award hasn't been made to them because um, uh, the university has outstanding debt, obviously they look at you like it's your responsibility and it's your fault that you didn't pay this. And it, it's very frustrating. Next page or next slide, please. So a few things that I've learned. One, certainly request a copy of, uh, uh, you know, uh, send a, a request to the G2G um, and get a copy of this Excel report. 
because you will at least find out uh, very shortly after something has been offset, you will find out what agency it was that, that you have an outstanding debt to. And potentially you'll be able to, in, in, in within four months, you know, the 120 days, be able to find the department at your institution that you can go after to get them to pay you money. A quick note here though is that, and I, I verified this with the treasury, if your department, again, my example was uh, CV Med, if CV Med makes a payment on that outstanding invoice, after the VA has submitted that to treasury for, for the top offset, the VA is then allowed to take that payment that the department finally sent them after the 120 days and apply that to a future invoice. So they don't turn around and refund that money. So even if you go back to the department and say, hey, this is outstanding, they offset this amount for this outstanding invoice, sometimes the department will tell you, well, no, I paid it and here's a copy of the check that I paid it. But it's already past 120 days and it's already been offset. So uh, I go back to the department and tell them it's their responsibility because I, I have no documentation information and I will not, I repeat, I will not uh, be the collection agency for my internal department that didn't pay an invoice for four months. But again, that's a battle that you will potentially have to fight. Um, again, specifically identify, uh, you know, what, what you want them to not use the institution's generic address. Uh, it's much easier if your address, you know, uh, the ones I was able to easily identify were ones that said just Stanford University, University was, was high, you know, just UNIV, and then it put the department name, CV Med or Oncology or whoever it might have, might happen to be in the name uh, uh, of, of, in the main address that they send their invoices to. That way, you know, I if you do can't. have to get a copy of the letter, you know what department to go um, after to try to get a copy of the invoice and to start working with them to, to understand uh, why that happens and, and why they didn't pay the invoice. Now, there is a few pieces of, of good information here. Uh, just August 29th, 2022, uh, uh, was, was informed that National Science Foundation award payments for grants and cooperative agreements are now exempt from treasury offset. So that's just the uh, NSF. And they're the only one, there's a lot of long list of, of, of payments uh, made by the treasury. This was the only agency I saw that, that had their uh, uh, grant and cooperative agreements exempted from top offsets, but there's a bunch of other ones that are out there and you can request that from, from treasury. Um, e again, even if you, get somebody to answer the phone, being able to get to uh, and get a copy of your invoice can be difficult. Don't give up, be, be uh, uh, diligent and uh, try your best to find out what department it is that is not paying their invoice or hasn't paid them. Get them to change the address so you know who to go after when you get the opportunity to do that. That's all I have and other than to say, good luck, um, you'll need it. Thanks, Tim. Um, yes, that, that sounds uh, like a lot of work, but thank you for sharing everything you've learned through this process. I think that's helpful. Um, and yes, comments in the chat regarding uh, NSF exemption from Todd. So uh, thank you for the very timely information today. Okay, so I wanted to take uh, the last few minutes of today's session and uh, kind of go back to uh, the beginning where we talked about uh, working with NIH um, and thinking about these uh, past 120 days requests for payments. And so if anyone you know would like to turn their camera on, come off mute um, and kind of share your experience about why these situations arise um, and, and we can start thinking about is there a way for FDP to partner with NIH to, uh, you know, look at this maybe from a different lens. Um, you know, it, 120 days sounds generous, but I think, you know, we all have been in situations where it just doesn't feel like enough. So um, what are those situations and, and how can we work with Michelle and her team? So if anyone would like to share, please uh, don't be shy. We're, we're all friends here. Um, and this is this is the work we do together.
Okay, so no one's no one's gonna have any requests after 120 days. <laughs> Uh, I will be the sacrificial lamb. I don't mind. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. Uh, I mean, one of the easy answers is late requests from subrecipients for payments of invoices. Um, and those are going to be for reasons that we don't necessarily know at first upon receiving the invoice. Uh, so I guess my the way I would frame the question, Michelle, is when that is the cause of potentially asking for funds after 120 days, um, should we play the role of NIH in that context and get all of those details and incorporate that into our request? Um, yes, should I'm going to tell you, Nate, that NIH is growing less patient with the late subrecipient requests. We implemented this, I think we put it out probably about five years, ago, six years ago. Um, we got the request, the um, 90 days extended, like we pushed hard because of the subrecipient. That was our main, you know, that was the storyline at that time. Hoping that the recipients would literally um, make sure that the subs understand that the requirements of your terms and conditions of award flow down. So if they're late to you, that's a compliance issue. And there needs to be some responsibility on the prime recipient to require subs to report timely. Just because we have, you know, subs, that does not denote the fact that we are going to accept those justifications any longer. It's becoming the rule and not the exception. And we moved from 90 days. And when I tell you, Nate, you were very involved. Like you were in my office. We talked about this. We hit hard. We need 120 days. It will give us additional time, an additional 30 days to reconcile. It hasn't happened. And frankly, HHS nor OMB and I, it's not, it's no longer a viable justification. It comes down to the fact that the prime recipient needs to put this information and spell it out in the subrecipient agreements. There are challenges like COVID, you know, public health emergencies, urgent, you know, you know, disasters that are beyond our control. But every time, when, when I tell you that we looked at the number of justifications requested and, and extensions requested based on the fact that the prime recipient couldn't get the information from the subs, it's astonishing. And I... I do understand and agree with with your statements. Um, I, I guess another way of asking is, we as the pass through, we can simply say no to late subrecipient invoice payment requests. And if NIH uh, is indicating that they would rather us just say no than forward the request on for payment, um, that's that, that's certainly a possible pathway. I mean, I think what we have to make sure of is that the subrecipient knows that they are literally um, placing themselves at risk. There are st standard terms and conditions that must be followed. And if there's something going on in the subrecipient's area, you know, I mean, things happen and that should be the exception. But we're seeing thousands, hundreds, if not thousands of subrecipient requests coming in because, you know, from the prime saying that the subrecipient is not in a position to provide the invoices. Um, and so while NIH has a overarching responsibility to enforce compliance on the prime, 
then I think the prime has to take on that responsibility to enforce compliance on the sub. You have a sub recipient written agreement that says that all of the requirements flow down. And we're starting to get a little concerned about these sub recipient agreements because it seems as though they're out there and, you know, space, but nobody's understanding that the prime does have to hold the sub accountable, just like NIH is going to hold the prime accountable. And that's a hard fact, but that's where we are. And so there's a, a comment in the chat that uh, one institution made the decision to keep the 90 day final requirement at our university. And it, that's something I think, Michelle, we talked about yesterday or, or this week, at least, uh, you know, that at my institution, we, everything we put out there is at 90 days. So reporting requirements, everything is at 90 days to, to give us uh, that time. And I think that's going to be um, essential given that we're going back to the final submission of the FFR. Um, and Michelle, I just wanted to clarify something on that uh, final uh, beginning again on, on October 1st. So you said that they, they can be submitted or they cannot be submitted if the cash, if the draw doesn't match the expenditures. They can submit it, but it won't be accepted. Got it. Okay. Will okay. it be rejected or you'll just not accept it and go back and check? It will be rejected. Okay, it'll truly be rejected. So it we, will truly be rejected. Okay, that's that's the problem. Yep. Yeah, understood why you have to do it, but yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So it, again, just another comment regarding the ninety days. Um, but you know, on the FDP templates, it's sixty days for that final invoice. So you know, that's still, in theory. Um, enough time. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's been the, the thing that um, PMS has said to NIH, and it's, it's very true. We've, you know, allowed this, right? And so we actually have perpetuated this um, mm -hmm. non compliance effort. And therefore, the system is forcing and compliance now. And that to me is an atrocity, right? You know, why would the system be driving the decisions? <laughs> um, and when we went into the payment management system as the single, um, single point of entry, that's where HHS landed. Like we are, NIH is the, literally, we are the ones that are just totally out of compliance with some of this. Most of our, even our other sister agencies that have research portfolios don't tolerate what we do. Um, and we have a passion and compassion for our recipients and for the science that we are funding. But when it comes down to it, you know, at some point, because we will be audited for COVID, I promise you, we won't we won't be able to do what we've been doing before. So I strongly encourage um, our recipients and our partners here that are participating here to make sure that you address your subrecipient, um, you know, contracts and agreements. It, 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 we can't continue. And as uh, Stephanie pointed out in the chat, that it. Um no one wants to be the first to say no. And so I think that's what's hard. And it, it, it does become an issue um, between the faculty members that are doing the work together. And I think that's where uh, sometimes we struggle. We, we don't wanna be the cause of uh, difficult conversations for faculty mm -hmm. between each other. So uh, Melissa has her hand raised, go ahead, Melissa. Um, well, just Christy, I was wondering, 
I think I've heard that finance audit and costing might be engaging in a working group with the subawards yes. subcommittee. Um, and it strikes me that if late subaward invoices are the most common cause of these late payment requests, um, very similar to the a survey that the subaward subcommittee did with kind of timing of of issuance of amendments. <laughs> um, that actually could be something that leads to uh, late invoices, right? Is that if you get your amendment late, then you get your account set up late, and then you get your invoices out late. Um, it it might be really interesting to to gather information like that on on what is causing this phenomenon, so that we can try to, um, as an organization, put out resources that would help get it at the root. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great idea, and I think. Uh... I think that would be enlightening to see those reasons. Um, I, I can definitely think of some reasons at my own institution why this happens. Um, and it, you know. And we talked not... about this yesterday, Christine. I think that that was the goal, right? To capture the data and to figure Absolutely. out what's truly a challenge and what's just a bad practice. Right. Yeah. So um, we're running short on time, but. Uh, I think this is definitely a, a good uh, way forward that we can think about, um, especially working with the subaward uh, subcommittee um, on this engagement. So more to come on that. And I think uh, that concludes for, for today's session. Um, there is a session today at 2.30 p.m. Eastern for the Faculty Administration Collaboration Committee. Um, but if you have anything, you know, that you want to raise that, uh, you didn't have a chance today, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, Michelle and I have regular meetings and we can certainly talk about these things. Uh, so thank you so much for your time today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.